Chapter 7, Freedom. In addition to meaning work, we have stated that psychologically the word karma also implies causation. Any work, any action, any thought that produces an effect is called a karma. Thus the law of karma means the law of causation, of inevitable cause and sequence. Wheresoever there is a cause, there an effect must be produced. This necessity cannot be resisted, and this law of karma, according to our philosophy, is true throughout the whole universe. Whatever we see or feel or do, whatever action there is anywhere in the universe, while being the effect of past work on the one hand, becomes on the other a cause in its turn and produces its own effect. It is necessary, together with this, to consider what is meant by the word law. By law is meant the tendency of a series to repeat itself, when we see one event followed by another, or sometimes happening simultaneously with another, we expect this sequence or coexistence to recur. Our old logicians and philosophers of the Naya school call this law by the name of Vyakti. According to them, all our ideas of law are due to association. A series of phenomena becomes associated with things in our mind in a sort of invariable order, so that whatever we perceive at any time is immediately referred to other facts in the mind. Any one idea, or according to our psychology, any one wave that is produced in the mind stuff, chitta, must always give rise to many similar waves. This is the psychological idea of association, and causation is only an aspect of this grand pervasive principle of association. This pervasiveness of association is what is, in Sanskrit, called vyakti. In the external world, the idea of law is the same as in the eternal, the expectation that a particular phenomena will be followed by another and that the series will repeat itself. Really speaking, therefore, law does not exist in nature. Practically, it is an error to say that gravitation exists in the earth or that there is any law existing objectively anywhere in nature. Law is the method, the manner, in which our mind grasps a series of phenomena. It is all in the mind. Certain phenomena happening one after another or together and followed by the conviction of the regularity of their recurrence, thus enabling our minds to grasp the method of the whole series, constitute what we call law. The next question for consideration is what we mean by law being universal. Our universe is that portion of existence which is characterized by what the Sanskrit psychologists call desha kala ninmitta, or what is known to European psychology as space, time, and causation. This universe is only part of infinite existence, thrown into a peculiar mold, composed of space, time, and causation. It necessarily follows that law is possibly only within this conditioned universe, because it there cannot be any law. When we speak of the universe, we only mean that portion of existence which is limited by our mind, the universe of the senses, which we can feel, see, touch, hear, think of, imagine. This alone is under law. But beyond it, existence cannot be subject to law, because causation does not extend beyond the world of our minds. Anything beyond the range of our mind and our senses is not bound by the law of causation, as there is no mental association of things in the region beyond the senses, and no causation without association of ideas. It is only when being or existence gets molded into name and form that it obeys the law of causation, and is said to be under law, because all law has its essence in causation. Therefore we see at once that there cannot be any such thing as free will. The very words are a contradiction, because will is what we know, and everything that we know is within our universe, and everything within our universe is molded by the conditions of space, time, and causation. Everything that we know or can possibly know must be subject to causation, and that which obeys the law of causation cannot be free. It is acted upon by every other agent and becomes a cause in its turn. But that which has become converted into the will, which was not the will before, but which, when it fell into this mold of space, time, and causation, became converted into the human will, is free. And when this will gets out of this mold of space, time, and causation, it will be free again. From freedom it comes and becomes molded into this bondage, and it gets out and goes back to freedom again. The question has been raised as to from whom this universe comes, in whom it rests, and to whom it goes. 
and the answer has been given that from freedom it comes, in bondage it rests, and goes back into that freedom again. So when we speak of man as no other than that infinite being which is manifesting itself, we mean that only one very small part thereof is man, this body and this mind, which we see are only one part of the whole, only one spot of the infinite being. This whole universe is only one speck of the infinite being and all of all laws, our bondages, our joys and our sorrows, our happiness and our expectations, are only within this small universe. All our progression and digression are within its small compass. So you see how childish it is to expect a continuation of this universe. The creation of our minds had to expect to go to heaven, which after all must mean only a repetition of this world that we know. You see at once it is an impossible and childish desire to make the whole of infinite existence conform to the limited and conditioned existence which we know. When a man says that he will have again and again the same thing which he is hating now, or as I sometimes put it, when he asks for a comfortable religion, you may know that he has become so degenerate that he cannot think of anything higher than what he is now. He is just his little present surrounding and nothing more. He has forgotten his infinite nature, and his whole idea is confined to these little joys and sorrows and heart jealousies of the moment. He thinks that this finite thing is the infinite, and not only so, he will not let his foolishness go. He clings on desperately on to Trishna and the thirst after life, what the Buddhists call Tana and Tisha. There may be millions of kinds of happiness and beings and laws and progress and causation all acting outside the little universe that we know, and after all, the whole of this compromises but one section of our infinite nature. To acquire freedom, we have to get beyond the limitations of this universe. It cannot be found here. Perfect equilibrium, or what the Christians call the peace that passeth all understanding, cannot be had in this universe, nor in heaven, nor in any place where our mind and thoughts can go, where the senses can feel, or which the imagination can conceive. No such place can give us that freedom, because all such places would be within our universe, and it is limited by space, time, and causation. There may be places that are more ethereal than this earth of ours, where enjoyments may be keener, but even those places must be in the universe and therefore in bondage to law. So we have to go beyond, and real religion begins where this little universe ends. These little joys and sorrows and knowledge of things end here, and the reality begins. Until we give up the thirst after life, the strong attachment to this, our transient conditioned existence, we have no hope of catching even a glimpse of that infinite freedom beyond. It stands to reason, then, that there is only one way to attain to that freedom which is the goal of all the noblest aspiration of mankind, and that is by giving up this little life giving up this little universe, giving up this earth, giving up heaven, giving up the body, giving up the mind, giving up everything that is limited and conditioned. If we give up our attachment to this little universe of the senses or of the mind, we shall be free immediately. The only way to come out of bondage is to go beyond the limitation of law, to go beyond causation. But it is most difficult thing to give up the clinging to this universe. Few ever attain to that. There are two ways to do that mentioned in our books. One is called the neti neti, not this, not this. The other is called iti, this. The former is the negative and the latter is the positive way. The negative way is the most difficult. It is only possible to the men of the very highest exceptional minds and gigantic wills who simply stand up and say, no, I will not have this, and the mind and body obey their will, and they come out successful. But such people are very rare. The vast majority of mankind choose the positive way, the way through the world, making use of all the bondages themselves to break those very bondages. This is also a kind of giving up, only it is done slowly and gradually, by knowing things, enjoying things, and thus obtaining experience and knowing the nature of things until the mind lets them all go at last and become unattached. The former way of obtaining non-attachment is by reasoning, and the latter way is through work and experience. The first is the path of jhana yoga, 
and is characterized by the refusal to do any work. The second is that of karma yoga, in which there is no cessation from work. Everyone must work in the universe. Only those who are perfectly satisfied with the self, whose desires do not go beyond the self, whose mind never strays out of the self, to whom the self is all in all, only those do not work. The rest must work. A current rushing down on its own nature falls into a hollow and makes a whirlpool, and after running a little in that whirlpool, it emerges again in the form of a free current to go on unchecked. Each human life is like that current. It gets into the whirl, gets involved into this world of space, time, and causation, whirls around a little, crying out, my father, my brother, my name, my fame, and so on, and at last emerges out of it and regains its original freedom. The whole universe is doing that. Whether we know it or not, whether we are conscious or unconscious of it, we are all working to get out of the dream of the world. Man's experience in the world has enabled him to get out of its whirlpool. What is karma yoga? The knowledge of the secret of work. We see that the whole universe is working. For what? For salvation, for liberty, from the atom to the highest being, working for the one end, liberty for the mind, for the body, for the spirit. All things are always trying to get freedom, flying away from bondage. The sun, the moon, the earth, the planets, all are trying to fly away from bondage. The centrifugal and the centripetal forces of nature are indeed typical of our universe. Instead of being knocked about in the universe and after long delay and thrashing, getting to know things as they are, we learn from Karma Yoga the secret of work, the method of work, the organizing power of work. A vast mass of energy may be spent in vain if we do not know how to utilize it. Karma Yoga makes a science of work. You learn by it how best to utilize all the workings of this world. Work is inevitable. It must be so. But we should work to the highest purpose. Karma Yoga makes us admit that this world is a world of five minutes, that it is something we have to pass through, and that freedom is not here, but it is only to be found beyond. To find the way out of the bondages of the world, we have to go through it slowly and surely. There may be those exceptional persons about whom I just spoke, those who can stand aside and give up the world, as a snake casts off its skin and stands aside and looks at it. There are no doubt these exceptional beings. But the rest of mankind have to go slowly through the world of work. Karma Yoga shows the process, the secret, and the method of doing it to the best advantage. What does it say? Work incessantly, but give up all attachment to work. Do not identify yourself with anything. Hold your mind free. All this that you see, the pains and the miseries, are but the necessary conditions of the world. Poverty and wealth and happiness are but momentary. They do not belong to our real nature at all. Our nature is far beyond misery and happiness, beyond every object of the senses, beyond the imagination, and yet we must go on working all the time. Misery comes through attachment, not through work. As soon as we identify ourselves with the work that we do, we feel miserable. But if we do not identify ourselves with it, we do not feel the misery. If a beautiful picture belonging to another is burnt, a man does not generally become miserable. But when his own picture is burnt, how miserable he feels. Why? Both are beautiful pictures, perhaps copies of the same original, but in one case very much more misery is felt than in the other. It is because in one case he identifies himself with the picture and not in the other. This I and mine causes the whole misery. With the sense of possessiveness comes selfishness, and selfishness brings on misery. Every act of selfishness or thought of selfishness makes us attached to something, and immediately we are made slaves. Each wave in the chitta that says, I and mine, immediately puts a chain around us and makes us slaves, and the more we say, I and mine, the more slavery grows, the more misery increases. Therefore, karma yoga tells us to enjoy the beauty of all the pictures in the world, but not to identify ourselves with any of them. Never say mine. Whenever we say a thing is mine, misery will immediately come. Do not even say, my child, in your mind. Possess the child, but do not say mine. If you do, then will come the misery. Do not say my house, do not say my body. The whole difficulty is there. The body is neither yours nor mine nor anyone's. These bodies are coming and going by the laws of nature, but we are free, standing as witness. 
This body is no more free than a picture or a wall. Why should we be attached so much to a body? If somebody paints a picture, he does it and passes on. Do not project that tentacle of selfishness. I must possess it. As soon as that is projected, misery will begin. So Karma Yoga says, first destroy this tendency to project this tentacle of selfishness. And when you have the power of checking it, hold it in and do not allow the mind to get into the way of selfishness. Then you may go out into the world and work as much as you can. Mix everywhere. Go where you please. You will never be contaminated with evil. There is the lotus leaf in the water. The water cannot touch and adhere to it. So will you be in the world. This is called Virgaya, dispassion or non-attachment. I believe I have told you that without non-attachment there cannot be any kind of yoga. Non-attachment is the basis of all the yogas. The man who gives up living in houses, wearing fine clothes, and eating good food, and goes into the desert, may be the most attached person. His only possession, his own body, may become everything to him, and as he lives he will simply struggle for the sake of his body. Non-attachment does not mean anything that we may do in relation to our external body, it is all in the mind. The binding link of I and mind is in the mind. If we have not this link with the body and with the things of the senses, we are not attached, wherever and whatever we may be. A man may be on a throne and perfectly non-attached. Another man may be in rags and still very much attached. First we have to attain this state of non-attachment and then to work incessantly. Karma Yoga gives us the method that will help us in giving up all attachment, though it is very indeed very hard. Here are the two ways of giving up on all attachment. The one is for those who do not believe in God or in any outside help. They are left to their own devices. They have simply to work with their own will with the powers of their mind in discrimination saying, I must be non-attached. For those who believe in God there is another way, which is much less difficult. They give up the fruits of work unto the Lord. They work and are never attached to the results. Whatever they see, feel, hear, or do is for Him. For whatever good work we may do, let us not claim any praise or benefit. It is the Lord's. Give up the fruits unto Him. Let us stand aside and think that we are only servants, obeying the Lord our Master, and that every impulse for action comes from Him every moment. Whatever thou worshipest, whatever thou perceivest, whatever thou doest, give up all unto Him and be at rest. Let us be at peace, perfect peace, with ourselves, and give up our whole body and mind, and everything as an eternal sacrifice unto the Lord. Instead of the sacrifice of pouring oblations into the fire, perform this one great sacrifice day and night, the sacrifice of your little self. In search of wealth in this world, thou art the only wealth I have found. I sacrifice myself unto thee, in search of someone to be loved. Thou art the only one, beloved, I have found. I sacrifice myself unto thee. Let us repeat this day and night and say, Nothing for me, no matter whether the thing is good, bad, or indifferent, I do not care for it. I sacrifice all unto thee. Day and night let us renounce our seeming self until it becomes a habit with us to do so, until it gets into the blood, the nerves, and the brain, and the whole body is every moment obedient to this idea of self-renunciation. Go then into the midst of the battlefield with the roaring cannon and din of the war, and you will find yourself to be free and at peace. Karma Yoga teaches us that the ordinary idea of duty is on the lower plane. Nevertheless, all of us have to do our duty. Yet we may see that this peculiar sense of duty is very often a great cause of misery. Duty becomes a disease with us. It drags us ever forward. It catches hold of us and makes our whole life miserable. It is the bane of human life. This duty, this idea of duty, is the midday summer sun which scorches the innermost soul of mankind. Look at those poor slaves to duty. Duty leaves them no time to say prayers, no time to bathe. Duty is ever on them. They go out and work. Duty is on them. They come home and think of the work for the next day. Duty is on them. It is living a slave's life at last dropping down on the street and dying in harness like a horse. This is duty as it is understood. The only true duty is to be unattached and to work as free beings, to give up all work unto God. All our duties are His. Blessed are we that we are ordered out there 
We serve our time. Whether we do it ill or well, who knows? If we do it well, we do not get the fruits. If we do it ill, neither do we get the care. Be at rest, be free in work. This kind of freedom is a very hard thing to attain. How easy it is to interpret slavery as duty. The morbid attachment of flesh for flesh is duty. Men go out into the world and struggle and fight for money or for any other thing to which they get attached. Ask them why they do it. They say it is a duty. It is the absurd greed for gold and gain, and they try to cover it with a few flowers. What is duty after all? It is really the impulsion of the flesh, of our attachment. And when an attachment has become established, we call it duty. For instance, in countries where there is no marriage, there is no duty between husband and wife. When marriage comes, husband and wife live together on account of attachment, and that kind of living together becomes settled after generations. And when it becomes so settled, it becomes a duty. It is, so to say, a sort of chronic disease. When it is acute, we call it disease. When it is chronic, we call it nature. It is a disease. So when attachment becomes chronic, we baptize it with the high-sounding name of duty. We strew flowers upon it. Trumpets sound for it. Sacred texts are set over it, and then the whole world fights, and men earnestly rob each other for this duty's sake. Duty is good to the extent that it checks brutality. To the lowest kinds of men, who cannot have any other ideal, it is of some good, but those who want to be a karma yogis must throw this idea of duty overboard. There is no duty for you and me. Whatever you have to give to the world, do give it by all means, but not as a duty. Do not take any thought of it. Be not compelled. Why should you be compelled? Everything that you do under compulsion goes to build up attachment. Why should you have any duty? Resign everything unto God. In this tremendous fiery furnace, where the fire of duty scorches everybody, drink this cup of nectar and be happy. We are all simply working out His will and have nothing to do with rewards and punishment. If you want the reward, you must also have the punishment. The only way to get out of the punishment is to give up the reward. The only way of getting out of misery is by giving up the idea of happiness, because these two are linked to each other. On one side there is happiness, on the other there is misery. On one side there is life, on the other there is death. The only way to get beyond death is to give up the love of life. Life and death are the same thing, looking at from different points. So the idea of happiness without misery, or of life without death, is a very good for schoolboys and children, but the thinker sees that it is all a contradiction in terms and gives up both. Seek no praise, no reward for anything that you do. No sooner do we perform a good action than we begin to desire credit for it. No sooner do we give money to some charity than we want to see our names blazoned in the papers. Misery must come as a result of such desire. The greatest men in the world have passed away unknown. The Buddhas and the Christ that we know are but second-rate heroes in comparison with the greatest men of whom the world knows nothing. Hundreds of these unknown heroes have lived in every country working silently. Silently they live and silently they pass away, and in time their thoughts find expression in Buddhas or Christ. And it is these latter that become known to us. The highest men do not seek to get any name or fame from their knowledge. They leave their ideas to the world. They put forth no claims for themselves and establish no schools or system in their name. Their whole nature shrinks from such a thing. They are the pure, sadvikas, who can never make a stir, but only melt down in love. I have seen one such yogi who lives in a cave in India. He is one of the most wonderful men I have ever seen. He is so completely lost the sense of his own individuality that we may say that the man in him is completely gone, leaving behind only the all-comprehending sense of the divine. If an animal bites one of his arms, he is ready to give it his other arm also, and say that it is the Lord's will. Everything that comes to him is from the Lord. He does not show himself to men, and yet he is a magazine of love and of true and sweet ideas. Next in order come the men with more rajas, or activity, combative natures, who take up the ideas of the perfect ones and preach them to the world. The highest men of men silently collect true and noble ideas and others, the Buddhist and Christ, go from place to place preaching them and working for them. In the life of Gautama Buddha, we notice him constantly saying that he is the 25th Buddha. 
the 24 before him are unknown to history, and although the Buddha known to history must have built up foundations laid by them, the highest men are calm, silent, and unknown. They are the men who really know the power of thoughts. They are sure that, even if they go into a cave and close a door and simply think five true thoughts and then pass away, these five thoughts of theirs will live through eternity. Indeed, such thoughts will penetrate through the mountains, cross the oceans, and travel through the world. They will enter deep into human hearts and brains and raise up men and women who will give them practical expression in the workings of human life. These sadvika men are too near the Lord to be active and to fight, to be working, struggling, preaching, and doing good, as they say here on earth to humanity. The active workers, however good, have still a little remnant of ignorance left in them. When our nature has yet some impurities left in them, then alone can we work. It is in the nature of work to be impelled ordinarily by motive and by attachment. In the presence of an ever active providence who notes even the sparrow's fall, how can man attach any importance to his own work? Will it not be blasphemy to do so when we know that he is taking care of the minutest things in the world? We have only to stand in awe and reverence before him saying, Thy will be done. The highest men cannot work, for in them there is no attachment. Those whose soul's soul is gone into the self, those whose desires are confined into the self, who can become ever associated with the self, for them there is no work. Such are indeed the highest of mankind, but apart from them everyone else has to work. In so working we should never think that we can help or even the least thing in the universe. We cannot. We only help ourselves in this gymnasium of the world. This is the proper attitude of work. If we work in this way, if we always remember that our present opportunity to work thus is a privilege which has been given to us, we shall never be attached to anything. Millions like you and me think that we are the great people in the world, but we all die, and in five minutes the world forgets us. But the life of God is infinite. Who can live a moment, breathe a moment, if this all-powerful one does not will it? He is the ever-active providence. All power is his, and within his command, through his command, the winds blow, the sun shines, the earth lives, and the death stalks upon the earth. He is the all in all. He is all and in all. We can only worship him, give up all fruits of work, do good for its own sake. Then alone will come perfect non-attachment. The bonds of the heart will thus break, and we shall reap perfect freedom. This freedom is indeed the goal of karma yoga.